Hello again and welcome to this PowerPoint that will take you through several key passages and model how to look for themes and then infer how they help reveal something really important about the novel and what the author was trying to get across. We're going to look mainly at two themes today. So we're going to start with this narration from Hortense early in the novel when she talks about Gilbert's constant speaking. This is in Jamaica when Gilbert is still dating her friend Celia and we can tell that Hortense doesn't have the best opinion of him. She says, and he talked. He talked tirelessly, beginning sometimes with a question to Celia and myself as if a discussion might take place. Let me ask you this one question, he would say. But he required no reply from either of us. No encouragement was necessary. He simply answered the inquiry himself and carried on. I was breathless just listening to this man. And all his talk, all his chatter was on just that one subject. There's a lot to dissect here, but I'm just going to focus on a few key phrases. He talked tirelessly. So the idea that he never gets exhausted by the amount that he speaks and the alliteration of the T sounds really communicate just the constant chatter of Gilbert, which would annoy anyone and especially your tents who are so critical of people. And then she quotes what he would say, let me ask you this one question. Now, that does sound like Gilbert. At this point in the novel, we've only heard from him a little bit, but his very direct style with the audience where he like talks to us seems to be true here. So I, she is remembering this accurately. So she's not really exaggerating. And then he talks so much she was felt breathless. So this is a hyperbole, but it accurately communicates just how much she feels Gilbert talks to the point where she's affected. And I think what really disturbs her is that she's not given the chance to speak herself. Gilbert's just kind of taking over. And because we have not had a flashback from Gilbert at this point in the novel, we just know how he feels about her once he once she arrives in England. We kind of have to take Hortense's word for it that when they met, he just talked and talked almost self-centeredly. Then later in the novel, when we do get his flashback, he does explain his incessant talking. He doesn't deny it. He admits it. But he gives a bigger reason as to why he speaks like this and it's because after he served in World War II and he returned to England he felt like a giant living on land no bigger than the soles of his shoes so suddenly Jamaica became a place that was constricting and not a place where he felt like he could have a lot of opportunity he continues to describe the environment um, such as the palm trees as their horizons as a prison Whereas tourists thought it was beautiful for him, it was just suffocating. So as a result, he says, I became a big talk man. So this is what Hortense was talking about. So it's not a characteristic he had prior to the war. It's one he had after. And it's just a coping mechanism to make up for the fact that he hasn't made much of himself and that he feels trapped in the small island. So even though he has very little money in his pockets, at this point, he lost all his money with that terrible bee endeavor that his cousin talked him into, and then they lost all the bees. So he feels like a fool, but the only way to, to make up for it is to talk. He's going to talk about the bombs, the planes, the bullets, the gun. He's going to talk about the king. He's even going to talk about Shakespeare. So he's using hyperboles too, but he's admitting, yes, I talked and talked, and a lot of it was lies, but it was one of the few ways that he could feel better about himself. And I think the most poignant lines that say this are, when my mirror could only return to me a look of disgust, a dainty girl like Celia Langley, who would gasp excited at my traveler's tales, puff me proud as a prince. So his mirror, the reflection, is something that he's ashamed of. He went proud to war. He looked at himself in the mirror prior to war as, wow, all the ladies are going to fall on my feet. I'm doing this for my mother country. And he comes back with nothing to show for it. He feels terrible. So if for a little while he can feel better about himself through Celia admiring his stories, then he's going to do that. And the rhetorical devices um, show that, like comparing himself to a prince, for example. But we're focusing on theme here. And when we think about that, 
that from Hortense's point of view, Gilbert's annoying. From his point of view, he's really, really sympathetic and honest with himself. So what theme does that truly represent? Well, it's perspective. And that's probably the most important theme in the whole novel. The idea that we don't really know what's going on in someone's life and all the events that led up to the present and why they act the way they do. But once we are a little compassionate and sympathetic, we can gain an understanding of that. And some characters do that much better than others. Gilbert is probably one of the better examples of a character who does start and tries to think of what others are going through, even when they may not be the nicest people to him. Similarly, Bernard also has a few good passages that deal with the theme of perspective. So for example, when he and Maxi are in India and they're sent on this scavenging mission to get parts from a plane that has been down, they get lost and they have to spend the night, but Bernard doesn't have his blanket. So he thinks back to his life in England when he used to like the heat and how things have changed. He says, I was pretty chilled, but no point admitting it. I lit a cigarette. Queenie never liked it hot. She would undo the top two buttons of her blouse, soak a handkerchief in cold water and put it on the back of her neck. Water would trickle down her front, the droplets disappearing into the pleat of her breasts. It's like living in an oven, she'd complain, lying back in a chair, finding herself with the newspaper. I tell her I liked it hot. The endless summer days when I was a boy, sleepy afternoons of bird songs, sitting out on the steps in the sun, the warmth on my bare legs, waiting for Pa to come home, his smiles, he sauntered up the road in his shirt sleeves. Phew, it's a scorcher today, Bernie. Cricket in the backyard and Ma's lemon drink with four sugars. He used to like the heat, and unlike Queenie, who would complain about it, he enjoyed it. And the reason he enjoyed it was because it reminds him of his father. When his father would come home from work, and they would play cricket after, and his mom would make lemonade. And notice that he's remembering summers when his dad, before his dad went to World War One, and he had PTSD. So this moment of warm recollection fits with the season of summer, which is so warm. But then when he gets to India, everything changes. In a few months, India's eternal heat had made dreaming of snow. So now he longs for the winters. And he has a, Levi does a really nice job describing the winters with lacy ice that creased the windows and stamping your feet up and down and your nose numb and all that. But now the opposite has happened yet again. Because he left his um, blanket, he can't warm himself. He's shivering. Um, be, be careful what you wish for out in this godforsaken place. I was shivering now, cupping my hand around the cigarette tip, clenching my jaws so my teeth couldn't chatter. And to make it worse, they then have a Japanese soldier who's trying to trick them, to trap them, by claiming he's actually a British soldier who needs help. Johnny, Johnny, come help me. And they spent this terrified night um, avoiding this soldier and hoping they don't get caught. So all of this shows Bernard's expanded perspective he went from a very, very sheltered life in England to one in India where he got to re-examine things. Unfortunately, though, because of his colonizer mentality and some of his inherent biases, it makes him more and more racist and classist. And unlike someone like Queenie or Gilbert, he does not expand his viewpoint to consider others. Now, this theme of perspective also does continue, though, with Bernard in the way he sees England. Although his racist ideas are solidified, if not exacerbated, he does start to see England a little differently. So he explains on his return that he needed to tell Queenie some kind of explanation for why he was missing for two extra years. But he can't bring himself to do it. He says, how do you describe snow to someone who's only lived in the desert? How do you describe the color blue to a blind man? These really effective comparisons to show it's just impossible. The other thing he realizes is that England had become so small. England had shrunk. It was smaller than the place I'd left. Street shops, houses bore down like crowds, stifling them in, in the feeble light that got through. After the war, he can no longer see England the same way he did before. It seems smaller and also deteriorated. And it is physically because of all the bombings from the German planes. But also he sees it in the faces of the people. He says, behind every face I saw were trapped the rememberings of war, guarded by a smile shrouded in a frown. frown excuse me. But everyone had them. So now PTSD also comes into the picture. And the other theme of the novel, the aftermath of war, Almost every character has to deal with this. And oftentimes it's not just the character, but their parents. 
So Gilbert's father, Bernard's father, even Queenie's father had to deal with this. And we see this here. So his viewpoint of England has changed and he's starting to see how everyone was affected by World War II, including himself. This is something that interestingly Gilbert recognizes and it ties back to what I was saying about his character earlier where he can sympathize with others. So even though when Bernard enters the Bly home he is terrible to Gilbert and the other tenants, Gilbert really quickly in his eyes recognizes the face of Bernard. He recognizes the PTSD. Come, I saw it reflected from every mirror on my dear Jamaican island, staring back on me from my own face. He sees the aftermath of war and the terror that it's caused, and he can relate to that, even if Bernard cannot see it in Gilbert. So that's another way that the theme really resonates between characters, ones who can appreciate it and ones who cannot. This also ties into the novel. Why is the novel called Small Island? It's symbolically important because on a literal level, England and Jamaica are both islands and they're both pretty small. But it's also about that perspective that once a person expands their experiences to other parts of the world, to understanding other people, they realize that where they come from and how they saw things was quite small. So we had that example in Bernard's passage, England has shrunk. But Gilbert also several times refers to Jamaica as a small island. So for example, when he returns, he says that instead of being joyous, he looked around and felt like he'd been betrayed, like a jilted lover, like someone who finds out that their lover has been cheating on them. Was this it? With alarm, I became aware that the island of Jamaica was no universe. It ran only a few miles before it fell into the sea. In that moment, standing Tom Kingston Harbor, I was shocked by the awful realization that, man, we Jamaicans are all small islanders too. And this really hits them because during the war, he felt proud to come from a big island like Jamaica, not some of the other soldiers who came from small islands, which is the next quote. The small islanders were simpletons. They gaped around at things in England, not we Jamaicans. But he realized, no, I'm just like them too. My island is small. He also says it to his cousin when, he, when his cousin is saying, stay in Jamaica. Why do you want to go back to England? You can do things here too. And Gilbert totally rejects that and says, Elwood, I have seen it with my own eye. The world out there is bigger than any dream you can conjure. This is a small island. Man, we just clinging so we don't fall off. Interestingly, even Michael Roberts also mentions that Jamaica is a small island. This is from Queenie's narration um, when they spent a second time together after the war. This is the time she got pregnant. And he was talking about what he was going to do next. And Queenie recalls that Michael said he was on his way to Canada. No small island that only needed a few fingers and a cupped hand to describe it. He didn't want to go back to Jamaica. So for Michael, Jamaica was a small island, not just because of the lack of opportunities, because of the personal failures. He had basically been banished by his parents after they found out he was having an affair with a married woman. So for him, he cannot go back for personal reasons. It's a prison for him because of his own personal failings. And that's the great thing about the novel too, when a character's viewpoint changes and it expands, they realize they come from a small place. But personally, they also realize, at least most of them do, not Bernard, but most of them realize that their own biases have kept them small-minded and small-hearted. And if they just realize to have some compassion for another human being and try to see the world from their eyes and try to understand what they've experienced, they can enlarge the own island of their hearts and their minds. So Small Island, that title really resonates literally and symbolically with most of the characters throughout the play, throughout the novel, excuse me. So be sure to consider that as you're looking through the novel again, seeing how some of these key themes pop up in, in important passages. Thanks again for tuning in.